Welcome to the Trust Factor Radio, bringing you interviews and insights to unlock the power of the subconscious mind to create authority, credibility, and trust with your host, the authority architect and best-selling author, Neil Howe. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and today my guest is Jimmy Sweeney. And Jimmy is a top direct marketer. Uh, he is a copywriter and a sales pro. Uh, Jimmy started as a door-to-door salesman and he built two successful mail order businesses. Uh, this was all pre-internet. Uh, since then, he's been selling uh, digital goods, uh, e-commerce online since uh, the late 90s. He is the CEO and founder of Honest E Online and currently lives with his wife in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, Honest E Online is all about e commerce success, and uh, his members there are granted access and use of the one of a kind Honest E Super Seal, uh, which is proven to increase online sales and split test after split test along with uh, access to the latest traffic and conversion strategies uh, that he teaches people so that they can thrive online. Uh, Jimmy Sweeney, welcome to the Trust Factor Radio. Thank you very much, Neil. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Well, this is going to be a great conversation because obviously with the Trust Factor Radio and the honesty, we definitely have a a lot of uh, correlating uh, minds to talk about uh, the same kind of thing. You know, people need trust. They need to trust somebody and they need to feel that they're honest before they're going to buy from them. So, um, you know, you obviously have a career in sales and getting people to buy. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting into your head to see how you've been able to use the psychology of sales, you know, before the Internet and how that has uh, transferred to the, the online that we're all familiar with now. Um, Jimmy, if you don't mind, just take us back a little bit, how you got started into sales and copywriting. Give us a little bit of your backstory. Sure, absolutely. So uh, I, well, my mother is a an author now. She's 83 years old. She's an author of over 80 books. So that's equals almost one book for every year of her life. Wow. Uh, but she didn't. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. She blows my mind. And she uh, didn't even write her first book until she was, I think, in her late 30s. And uh, back then, the, the publisher, the, the person that published her first book was a gentleman named Melvin Powers of Wilshire Book Company. And he was known as the Dean of Mail Order. Uh, and he had this office in uh, this warehouse and office in North Hollywood, California, and uh, he ended up publishing my mom's first book. It was on horses, and uh, I can't even remember exactly the topic, but it was horse horse related. And he liked the book, uh, and I met him, and I was a teenager, and I was just fascinated with what he was doing. He sold self help books. This guy uh, actually published Think and Grow Rich. Uh, Napoleon Hill's book. He published uh, uh, Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz Mm. um, and other just monster successes. One of the favorite books I read that he published is called The Knight in Rusty Armor. And it's Knight with a K, Knight in Rusty Armor. What an incredible book. You can still get that online. Melvin passed away in his 90s in 2013, but he uh, he took me under his wing. I got lucky. I was just so blown away with mail order. Uh, and so I started at a young age. Um, he told me things to read. I read his book. Uh, um, gosh, it's uh, How to Get Rich in Mail Order or something like that. Um, he's got some incredible books. But uh, anyway, I got lucky with uh, with him as a mentor. And he took a liking to me and so that's when I, how I got into mail order and I studied so much, practiced my copywriting. And the thing that's great about Melvin is he's a, he's a real straight shooter. So I would send him some copy on something and he would say, eh, you're, it's not quite there. <laughs> you need work. And so I'd go back to the drawing board and tweak. And I'll never forget the day I wrote some copy for something and I sent it to him. I was real proud of it. And, you know, his response was grade A well done. You're finally getting it. And that was just a moment I'll never forget. And I, uh, I 
just that's what I've done for many years, copywriting. Um, but I also had a, a career in door-to-door -door sales. I worked as a door-to-door -door salesman um, and I was making a lot of money uh, selling a auto repair shop package um, for a local garage with this company in the San Fernando Valley of California. And we sold them for 40 bucks, 39.95. And I was getting not quite half of the, the uh, purchase price, but I was like $15 a sale. And if I hit a certain number, I'd get $20 a sale. And back then in the, uh, gosh, in the eighties, you know, you're talking about uh, if I was selling two of those an hour, I'm making, you know, 30 to 40 bucks an hour back then, which mm. was a lot of money. And I saw how this business worked from the ground up. Uh, I wanted to keep the whole 40 bucks on the sale. And I started my own business after a couple of years, had my own crew of salespeople um, and uh, did that for uh, a few years. Um, well, I mean, I, I did door to door for a long time, but I actually turned it into a mail order business too. I created an information product based on what I learned going door to door and people's feelings about visiting a new auto repair shop. And I built this whole course based on honesty and trust, which really goes into, you know, what we're talking about here. And that's where businesses can thrive when they can get that, uh, they can hit that uh, very personal hot button of trust and honesty. And mm -hmm. uh, so I sold this this package through the mail. I advertised in trade magazines that only independent auto repair shop owners would read. And I used all my mail order skills and knowledge that I had acquired. And uh, I sold an info product. This was in the 90s. I sold an uh, info product for um, between... 400 and 800 dollars and then i had a back-end product that went for a couple thousand um i wrote a a 36 page free report so that's what i would adver advertise in the uh, magazines and it would mm -hmm. say you know free report teaches uh auto repair shop owners to uh uh triple their business that's that's not even close to the exact copy but it was a, it was an ad and they could get this free report we'd send them the free report and we'd track everything. If they didn't buy, we'd send it to them again with another type of cover sheet, second notice, third notice. Then we'd send them a postcard, fourth and final notice, this bright green postcard with all copy, no pictures on it, like tiny copy that's filling the whole postcard. And by the way, my 36-page uh, report had zero pictures in it, all copy. And it starts out by saying, uh, I'm going to show you how to double your business. And I can't even change my own oil on my car. What the hell do I know about uh, improving an auto repair shop? Um, and I used, I cussed in it a little bit. You know, I used bull, you know, <laughs> shit. Mm -hmm. and I, 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 not much, but just a sprinkle. And anyway, that report converted 12% of the people to spend that kind of money. Um, with me from a ad in a trade magazine to those four mailings, 12% of those leads would spend well over a thousand bucks. And uh, it was all paper and ink, cassette tapes, uh, like a three ring binder of information. I gave each shop owner a, a consultation over the phone with me. And then um, we showed them how to do the little packages that I sold door to door. We showed them how to sell those right over the counter. Mm. And so I went from that business uh, and I had another mail order business, but, you know, that's another topic, um, both successful. Oh, I, I, in fact, I'll give you just a quick rundown on that one. So I, I had a, uh, a mail order business. It was in the credit market. Uh, and I remember taking out an advertisement in the National Enquirer. And at the time it had a three and a half million circulation. And the, the advertisement was called the Digest Unit. And the Digest Unit, it was called that because it was the size of the Reader's Digest. So that's the size you could picture for the ad. Mm -hmm. It cost, I'll never forget it, cost me $5,800 for that ad. I wrote the ad using my copywriting expertise, and I generated $40,000 in orders over the next two weeks. Wow. So you talk about uh, an ROI. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unbelievable. Well, back then, uh, 
being in the credit market, um, they there there were some red flags, uh, and I and and what I was doing was uh, totally above board. It was a, a great product, um, but there was some scams in that industry, and there are to this day. And so a lot of my mail got held up at the U.S. Postal Inspection Service in Burbank, California, and my dad was an attorney at the time, and we had to go into the office and. You know, we talked with this guy. He had all our uh, uh, like thousands of dollars of mail in his office that he stopped. Uh, that and you know, after literally 15 minutes of going through things, going through the laws and what we were doing, he released all the mail, and I continued, and uh, it was uh, pretty interesting. But I ended up um, getting online in uh, the late 90s, uh, and. You know, as they say, the rest is kind of history. It's history. Yeah. yeah well, well, let me stop you there because I want to take it back a little bit. Many sure. of the people like yourself that, uh, you know, have done great in sales end up becoming great copywriters and moved into the digital space now really earned their chops going door to door, belly to belly, and really finding out, uh, you know, what – the person actually wants what their uh, you know holdups are from buying people. Tell me about what you learned really just talking to people one on one. Oh yeah, that's a great question. Boy, so much. Um, uh, well, I would say uh, a few things. Number one, you're not really necessarily selling the product; you're selling yourself uh, at the door for sure. You're selling yourself. Uh, People buy emotionally, and then they'll um, figure it out logically afterwards. Uh, I would always start off, um, you know, friendly and with a little bit of humor. And at the door, I would actually hand them the package so that they were holding it. And they would actually have to hand it back to me if they didn't want it. But I would Mm -hmm. say, hey, you might be interested in this. That was my first move. I'd hand it to them. And then I'd pull out my pen, and I'd start going through the – the services they that they would get from this local garage by purchasing this little package of auto repair, you know, oil changes, things of that nature. Um, but one thing that really worked incredibly well, which is the social proof that I started to kind of use and I didn't even know I was using it. So I had this pocket protector that I would keep uh, and I was wearing like a, a shirt from the auto repair shop. It said, you know, Jimmy on it and had the whatever the auto repair was shop was on it. And when somebody would write me a check at the door and buy the package, I would put that in my, my left breast pocket protector. So everybody could see it. Mm. And so, uh, people would, you you could see people's eyes just staring at it. Like, what is that? Oh, that's a check. Mm. So I started, I started noticing this very early on. And what I would do when I would walk up to doors is I would actually be holding a check and I and then I would put it in my pocket. I would draw even more attention to it. And as the conversation would get comfortable, I would say, by the way, you know, the Joneses next door just picked one up and I'd show them the check. And they would, it was amazing. They'd say, oh, really? Yeah. In fact, you know, they buy two of them or whatever it might be. In fact, the Wilsons right across the street got one. I mean, I have a bunch of checks. I'll show it to them. Yeah. I said, they're very popular. I mean, really, the bottom line is you got a car. We want your business. We know that if you love us, you trust us, we do great work for you. You're going to be a a, uh, a customer for years to come. And so that approach, that social proof at the door was extremely powerful in stringing together sale after sale after sale. And, And so let's say I sold three in a row. I would be at that fourth door and I would say, so, you know, the Wilsons, the Joneses, the Smiths all got one. Please don't break my streak. You know, and then they chuckle. And uh, uh, so social proof was huge. It's huge to this day. Uh, but one thing that uh, is, is also huge in sales um, is over-delivering. And that's a cliche. Uh, and, you know, if you want to ask me something else real quick, I don't want to go on and on on a, uh, a stream of consciousness, but I can talk about over-delivering and 
what I think well, of that as well. Well, let's just move from the door to door, you know, where you're going one to one, you know, obviously going door to door and having the same conversation with people over and over mm-hmm. is, is effective, is very personable. But how do you get that same kind of uh, trust and humor that you were talking about mm-hmm. into uh, a sales letter w- with copywriting? Yeah, well, and that's a that's a another great question. Um, you know, it it just becomes part of you. Uh, you know that you've. Yeah, you know, I know how I made sales at the door, and that kind of just flows right into my sales copy. But I mean, I read all the classics too. I read all the classics. I think the strong suit for me is not only can I write great copy compelling headlines of, you know, first paragraph copy that just sucks per- the person right into the copy and pulls them through the copy. But then you actually have to make the sale. And since I knew how to make the sale at the door, one of the toughest sales you could ever do, belly to belly, as you say, that is the most difficult sale because we're cold calling on somebody. We are interrupting a dinner A person just got off work. They're relaxing with a glass of wine, watching TV. And here I come knocking on the door. Well, if I don't make them maybe chuckle a little bit and they take me seriously immediately and I don't have a smile on my face, they're, you know, they want me out of their, their life. They want me off their driveway, you know, get out of here. So Mm -hmm. humor was big uh, and getting people to smile and actually taking them out of their headspace of who the hell is at my door right now. And so I would, you know, I learned this from a master door-to-door salesman. I might point at somebody's shoes and say, hey, nice shoes. Where'd you get those? I mean, anything. They're like, what the guy, what is this guy talking about? But the, the going back to closing the sale, you, you, you have lots of real good, talented copywriters out there, but they're not necessarily good at closing the sale. And when you are going to close the sale in copy, um, you want to walk people through like I call it future pacing. So here's what's going to happen when you click this button to order. Uh, And using empathy, empathy is huge when you're asking for the order. Um, So it's, it's making that, that connection one-on-one and, and just so that they're feeling comfortable with placing that order. Uh, and, and it's it's there's a real fine line between getting the order and not getting the order. A couple little tweaks uh, in your offer uh, can just make a huge difference. So it's not the headline and all the copy. It, that's doing its job. It's getting everybody to the offer, but your offer just isn't working. Hmm. It's just not moving the needle. They're not pulling out the wallet out of their purse or out of their back pocket, getting the credit card out and making the purchase. Why are they not doing that? because they don't necessarily trust you. They want to think about it. They want to sleep on it. They want to read a bunch of reviews. Um, They're just not ready to take action. And so if that's the case, how do you, how do you get inside their head and grab their brain and get them out of that? Think about it, sleep on it, um, read reviews, just not right now, maybe tomorrow mentality. How do you, jar that open and get them to think about actually taking out the card to make the purchase. And when you can unlock that in your copy, that's where you have massive breakthroughs. And so all this stuff of learning door to door to close sales um, and then, you know, writing copy that closed sales. And it's just, it's innate to me now, uh, but it's, it's, it has to, a lot of it has to do with empathy and then actually, being wide open about the fact that, hey, you're about to, you know, purchase this. Uh, you're, you're thinking about pulling out your card and, and, uh, and ordering. Well, guess what? If you were to do that, here's exactly what you could expect. And you could have just a 30 second video that shows them. Here's, here's what you're going to go through, whatever it is. But you really have to get in there and mm-hmm. make that happen. Otherwise, people are going to sit on the fence and they're going to move on. And that's the difference uh, between A copy and C copy. Anyway. Yeah, and then the, there's the, the the question again between short and long copy. How long should your copy be? Right. 
great question. Your copy should be as long as it needs to be and not a word less. And that's from Dan Kennedy. Right. Uh, <laughs> but think about it. I had a 36 page report that had zero pictures in it. It was all text and it converted 12% of shop owners to purchase my product uh, in the mail order business. Um, you know, as far as long copy, long copy, if, if, if it's got your prospect's name on it, you know, if, if, if this is your prospect, if you've targeted your marketplace well, they're going to read everything you got to say. If you start droning on and on, uh, you know, you're going to lose them. But I know uh, a guy named Jeff Paul, years back, he used the same strategies of advertising in uh, trade magazines, and he was doing this for the financial planners market. And his first report was like 24 pages. Free report, you know, how these financial planners can increase their business. 24 pages. Then he said, you know what, I'm going to write a much longer report. No pictures in it. He wrote another report. And it was, uh, it was around 56 to 60 pages long, and it doubled his conversions. So I tend to write super long copy, but I write compelling copy, and I know who I'm writing it for. Because look, if you write copy based on length, just for the heck of it, oh, I want to keep it short. Who's going to read this long copy? Well, you're, you don't even understand it then. Hmm. Uh, because all it takes for a 1% conversion is one person's just like, wow, that, that is great. This is for me. And they buy. But if you're writing copy just for length and you're trying to kind of be everything to everybody, you're trying to accommodate because with long copy, you can accommodate scanners. You can have sub headlines. So they, there's two readership paths. You can have all the copy. Then the scanner can read the sub headlines and then they get down to the PS area and the close and the offer. And you're restating a lot of things. So it's, but yeah, anybody wants to get good at copy. There's some of the best books on copywriting are way before the internet. Um, so the internet is just a way to another vehicle to offer things on. Um, copy will never change. Great copy. It's all based in human nature. Right. So. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's, you know, what I see over and over as well is, you know, it really comes down to the psychology of, you know, can I trust this person? Is this something that I want and need right now? And if you can get people to figure that that is what they want, then, you know, obviously you're, you're going to go a long way. But how, how much of uh, copywriting is formulaic and how much of it is an art? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. There are a lot of formulas out there. Um, I don't use formulas because I just kind of write. Um, I mean, I've read so much on it. I could probably shortcut a lot of my copy by making it more formulaic. I do have swipe files. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, it's... I'm kind of torn on it because yeah, you can, I'm a copywriter that is not for hire. I write my copy for myself and my businesses. Uh, but for, if I was a copywriter for hire, I would definitely be using, uh, formulas and, um, swipe files and, you know, to get the stuff done quicker. Uh, and it would still be effective because, you know, great copy is whether it converts or not. It has nothing to do, oh, wow, this person writes beautiful copy. Well, show me what their conversions are. Um, and uh, formulaic, you know, it, I, I printed out something the other day. Uh, gosh, it's looking around for it here. Um, it is a uh, by David Frey. I don't know if you ever heard of David Frey. Yes, I do. Yeah, okay. He's got a two-pager you can find on Google which has like 12 principles to copy and it's like a formula and you can just grab the PDF. Uh, it's F R E Y. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a heck of a document for a, a little roadmap to copy in two pages. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's a tough, it's a tough question to answer. I don't use a formula. I write just from my gut instinct on who I'm writing it for. And, uh, 
it's it's a painful exercise, mm. <laughs> but it, but it's worth it. Well, we, we've stuck on copy for quite a while here, and I think it's one of the, the number one skills that you need uh, for any business is being able to persuade somebody with the written word in, in order to mm-hmm. buy something from you. You know, what better, better skill could you have than that? But, right. um, you know, we talked about social proof earlier as well, and I want to talk about the honesty online um, which is very much to deal with uh, social proof. Tell me a little bit about that business. Yeah, so Honesty Online was kind of born out of um, just another, I mean, it's, it's honesty and trust is, is, a, uh, is a powerful topic. If people trust you, uh, they want to do more business with you, especially if your products are great. I mean, you could have a subpar product and they still trust you, but they're not going to become repeat buyers. Um, Honesty Online was based on just a quick summary on that. Back in the maybe 2003, 2004, ClickBank, uh, I used ClickBank for my digital products. And so on there, I didn't have control of their order form. And ClickBank used the Better Business Seal of approval on their order form. And all of a sudden, after a couple of years, they, they removed it. And I actually saw a decrease in conversions. And I contacted ClickBank and I said, why did you guys remove the Better Business Bureau seal? And they said, well, we were having technical problems with it. They, it wasn't, uh, anyway, long story short, I said, wow, that's interesting. I started thinking about how could I do a a, a seal of approval, quote unquote approval in a different way that could um, breathe some trust, the trust factor, the honesty factor into an e-commerce business and do it in a way where it wasn't like we as an entity would approve this business, but visitors to that website would approve them. And, and we structured it much differently. But the bottom line is that was where the idea was born out of. And then we also knew the two factors for online business owners, um, they're never going to change. If you want to be successful online, even offline, I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's traffic and it's conversion. So you got to generate traffic, whether it's eyeballs to your website or foot traffic into your store. And then you have to be able to take that traffic and convert it. And you do that through great sales copy and marketing messaging and everything else. Uh, And so we decided that we would build this business around um, the honesty seal, which uh, just wins every single split test. Uh, We have some wording in the seal that says click to verify before you buy. So it's uh, there's some psychology there before I buy, before you buy, they're thinking to themselves, huh, they're all you're you're prepping them for buying mode with this Mm -hmm. seal. And it's, that's why it wins the split tests. It's, it's very unique. But then we also supplement this business with, with our customers. We teach them um, unique traffic and conversion strategies. So I talk in my newsletter about um, copywriting strategy and, and traffic tactics. And we're actually revamping the business right now as we speak. We're going to redo the... Uh, the video sales letter. Um, we've got some new seals, shapes, sizes, colors. Uh, we're going to be doing a brand new newsletter. Um, I'm really excited about it. We're working on it uh, right now. And so, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, been a great business. I've had it since 2005, and then I sell uh, downloadable products to job seekers in another business that I have. And those are my two online businesses. Yeah, well, you know, the the honesty uh, badge, obviously, is going to convey trust, you know, what I call trust trigger. You know, people like to see uh, some image of trust when they come to your site, and especially yes. when it's on uh, the, the buy page. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they want to be feel comfortable and have certainty that uh, they're not going to get scammed. So uh, trust and honesty is really important. But, you know, I want to talk about the two things briefly. Uh, You know, we could probably talk for hours on this alone. (laughs) But, uh, you know, traffic is one thing and getting people to your site. But conversion, you know, if you can really increase that conversion, you can increase your profits very quickly without really increasing your traffic, right? Yes, 
Absolutely. Uh, traffic and conversion are the twin pillars to online success, no doubt about it. Um, because one without the other, you don't really have anything. You could have a ton of traffic and you can't convert squat. So you're not making any money. And you could have great conversions and very little traffic. And it just teases you to the possibilities. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, when someone has great conversions, they're going to figure out the traffic because they might have somebody do a mailing for them. And then word gets around and, you know, all of a sudden they have lots of traffic. So um, in that sense, maybe conversion would be more important, I guess. But you know, really, the magic happens when traffic, lots of traffic meets great conversions. Uh, that's where the magic is. Um, and, and regarding honesty, by the way, I chose the word honest. I think it's one of the most powerful words in the English language. I think it's better than you know, trust sounds a little bit uh, cliche or trite. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the word honest is, is just incredibly powerful. And I'm the only company that ever did anything with that word in, in that arena. And I chose that word for a reason. And I learned it when I was doing the uh, auto repair shop stuff. Uh, and I created slogans for um, businesses. Finally, an honest mechanic. I used honest in that business a lot in advertising that I uh, help shop owners with. So yeah, uh, conversions. What was the, um, uh, what did you want me to comment on, Neil? On uh, Yeah, basically yeah. just the, the traffic and conversion. I was trying to make the point that you, uh, you said there that the conversion really is probably more important because there's multiple ways that you can get traffic, but if it's not converting, then it's kind of, you know, you don't have much. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's true. And I always look at them as the, the two twin pillars of, of any business, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, traffic and conversion. Um, so conversion to deal, uh, conversion and trust, they go hand in hand, but they have to be done in a compelling manner. The more someone trusts you while they're reading your offer, they read your copy, but they read your offer and they start to feel trust and you've done your job in the copy. That's where you can have a breakthrough in conversions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's where you use empathy and the future pacing of showing them what's going to happen if they decided to get off the fence and place the order, what's going to happen right now and why do they need to take action right now? And that's where you can use a guarantee very uh, stealthily, um, you know, guarantees can be used to make that happen, to address the, I'm going to think about it, sleep on it, read some reviews, and I'm going to come back to this. Well, guess what? Most people don't come back. Mm -hmm. They're gone. And so you want to convert as many of those people, those fence sitters that are reading your offer. And so you really want to get into the guts of that. And that's where you'll have your conversion breakthroughs. And it's, it's in the wording. It's not in the color of the order button. You, you can have little tiny split test breakthroughs there, but it's really digging into the copy at the offer level and getting that trust and uh, using empathy and them knowing. Oh, in fact, I'll share uh, one other thing if you'd like me to. I can, uh, it's a pretty good analogy for going after niche markets. Um, mm, yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I've came up with this just uh, recently, and it was a really – really clear uh, analogy for how important it is to not go after the broad market, but to target your marketplace. You, you don't want to get into the health and fitness marketplace and just compete with some of these brilliant marketers in, in this broad space that is all over planet earth. You, you've really got no chance. The, the advertising is too expensive you're not selling anything specific to anyone. You're just in the health and fitness market and everybody else has figured it out. So how could you get into the health and fitness market? How could you do that? Well, here's an example. Uh, let's say you are a female flight attendant and you, um, you're dealing with jet lag. You're dealing with germs on the plane. Uh, your immune system can be a little bit compromised and you have layovers all over the world. You get off the plane, you go into a hotel, but you found a way to protect your immune system, keep really physically fit. You have this health and fitness plan that you incorporate throughout your work and at your layovers, 
and you put it into an online course and you want to offer it to other flight attendants, but you're not going to offer it to male flight attendants. You're only going to offer it to female flight attendants. That is the ultimate niche market right there. Hmm. Flight attendants. So, th- so, so let's just, uh, let's just ask the simple question. A flight attendant can purchase this course from another flight attendant, or they can just purchase this generic fitness program over here, which might be great. But which one is that female flight attendant probably going to buy nine times out of 10? Right. They're going to buy from the other (laughs) flight attendant. Exactly. And you know why? Built in trust. They're one, you know, they recognize this is one of us. This is one of our tribe here. So this flight attendant can now target the, you know, hundreds of thousands of female flight attendants or millions. I don't know what the number is, but they can be targeted. They can be found in this day of social media, technology, targeting, everything. They can be found. And that female flight attendant could have huge success uh, doing that. And they just entered the health and fitness market. That's how important it is to choose the people you go after. You don't just sell broadly to anybody. So what I tell everybody, and one of the most important things I could say on this call is to find your female flight attendant right. and, and go after that because they know that you're one of them. So what does that do? That's built in trust right there. They're speaking our language. You've already gotten over that big hurdle. And then you write the, you'll write even more compelling copy because you are going after a marketplace that you, it could be a hobby of yours, whatever it may be. But when you think you're going after a niche market, look to drill down even further. So this female flight attendant could have sold it to all flight attendants, but no, she's going to just go after female flight attendants. Their body makeup's a little different. This is designed for female flight attendants. So that is, um, that is paramount to that- that, yeah, that is a great tip there. And I know what most people are probably thinking listening to this is, well, you know, if I narrow down too much, then I'm not going to be able to make any money. Right, right. Uh, well, you know, first of all, that that could be the case, right? I mean, you could go after uh, female underwater basket weavers um, that uh, are over the age of 100, and that's not, that's going to be a niche market that you can't sell to. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, so you use your common sense and you say, "Hey, you do your due diligence. How many uh, how many prospects do I have in the world?" Right. Um, one of the a great way to segment is for women to segment to women, men to segment to men if they want by sex, uh, by whatever. I mean, the golf market, for example, huge marketplace. You could go after. Uh, certain men in a uh, certain age where they're having back issues, right? You target only those golfers and you have a solution for them. There's many ways to do it, but it's of utmost importance to go after a niche market for the highest chances of success. And uh, anything that you can identify personally where they know that you're one of them and you have interest in, um, you're getting past that trust barrier. Uh, I mean, well, you're, you're, they're trusting you um, immediately. You, mm-hmm. You're uh, you're approaching that uh, honest and trustworthiness, and they know that you speak their language, and you'll have much more success marketing to a niche group of people. And it's excellent. Huge. Well, Jimmy, you've given us some gems here on uh, this interview, and I know there's so much more that we could be talking about, but uh, you talk more in your newsletter. Um, Tell us a little bit about how people can get in contact with you and how they can get that newsletter as well. Sure. Uh, Basically, you can go to Honest E, that's with an E, stands for e-commerce, Honest eonline.com slash free. And you can join Honesty Online absolutely free. It's a 30-day free trial. Um, So you get to test drive everything. Uh, You can actually think about it while you're experiencing it, which is the ultimate way to think about it. And uh, we give you some freebies and you'll be able to use everything fully as a, uh, as a member. And um, that's basically it. Honest E online.com slash free. And we'd uh, love to uh, have you on board. Excellent. Well, there's nothing better than learning from somebody that's uh, 
been there uh, for years and done it all from the door to door to the copywriting to the uh, the honest e and the conversions online so uh, thanks very much for uh, talking with us today jimmy sweeney thanks for being my guest on the trust factor radio thank you very much neil it was a pleasure and uh, be happy to do it again when we we can uh, tackle another topic thanks so much Excellent. Well, to our listening audience, if you like what you hear, hit that like button and share, and we'll see you next time on the show. You've been listening to the Trust Factor Radio with Neil Howe. To learn about the resources mentioned in the show and to listen to past episodes, go to thetrustfactorradio.com. To get a copy of the book, The Trust Factor, go to thetrustfactorbook.com. If you are ready to act now and build your authority, credibility, and trust, schedule a consultation with Neil at theauthorityarchitect.com.